Hello and welcome to the Hot Rod Bible Study where tonight we are in Colossians chapter 3. But before we do that, we're going to look at Psalm 1. So put your handy dandy bookmark in Colossians 3. Open it up. You already placed in handy dandy bookmark. Yeah, mine. Uh, in Psalm 1 where it says... Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his, and his law he meditates and day, day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. I um, thought that's somewhat pertinent for our time right now that blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. One other thing I'd like to share with you this evening, and just put on my heart, something a friend of mine gave me a number of years ago, entitled The Life Cycle of Nations, where it says, starts off, bondage, spiritual faith, great courage, liberty, abundance, Complacency, apathy, dependency, back to bondage. You can see how that works throughout nations that have been, continue to be great. Here's the next one, the six woes of Isaiah. Materialism, hedonism, flaunting of sin, denial of the word of God, relativism, where right is wrong and wrong is right, and the lack of justice. Cycle of nations. We need to continue to be in prayer that our nation isn't going through those latter cycles. Okay, please join me in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you that we live in a place where we're able to meet like this. We are able to study your word. Uh, we are able to be in your presence because as your word says, where two or more are gathered in your name, there you are. So we're happy to have you here, Lord. Pray that you do send your Holy Spirit upon us, that you open our hearts and minds to your word, and that you keep me out of the way. And I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Okay, Colossians 3. Again, this is a, a letter that our... Hero Paul wrote to the church in Colossa where uh, there's some goofy stuff going on that he was trying to keep him from doing, trying to keep him from heading off into Gnosticism, trying to keep him from uh, being uh, Judaizers where you have to follow so many laws, uh, but also encouraging them in their faith. So it starts off here. If then, verse 1, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are, put, are to put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. 
Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Jew nor Greek, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in, the, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Wives, submit to your own husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bondservants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men-pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not to men, knowing that the Lord will re that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. That's where we're going to stop. We're going to look to see <clears throat> what's going on here. Verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is. Okay, if you're raised with Christ, what did the risen Christ do? First thing he did is he got out of the tomb. So what does that mean for us? Well, that means all that junk from your history, all the stuff that you have done, don't stay in that stuff. Get out of that tomb. Put that behind you. Another thing he did is he spent the rest of his life on earth in ministry. Hmm, that's for us. Gee, does that mean I think everybody should be leading Bible study or preaching on the street corner or knocking on doors? No, what ministry is, is serving God. How do you serve God? Well, most of the time through just regular day stuff. People need to know that you're a Christian, as they say, they'll know we are Christians by our love. If we show people disdain or uh, hate or whatever, we're not showing Christian love. It's a big responsibility, but that's what we're called to do. And the other thing that Jesus did his last days on earth was he looked forward to being in heaven. Boy, that's something that we can do. I think that's something that we ought to be doing daily, is seeking the Lord and looking forward to being in heaven. And it says, seek those things which are above, not the carnal things that we have here on earth. Uh, some of those in false religions expect you to do that, to seek the carnal things, such as being good and earning your way in. Doesn't work. Nothing wrong with being good, but being good for the purpose of salvation you ain't never going to get there. Salvation is through Jesus and Him alone. Again, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Guess what? We're going back to the book of Psalm one more time. Book of Psalms, I'm looking at Psalm 110 where it says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. 
Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. You have the dew of your, mouth, of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is your right hand. He shall execute kings in the days of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. Are we doing all right? My producer director had to check things out. It looks like we're still going okay. All right. He shall drink of the brook of the wayside, by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. This is an interesting verse. He shall drink of the brook of the wayside. That's showing Christ's humiliation. What happened during Passion Week? What would happen? Okay, he was in prison. He had people yelling at him, crucify him. He had people beating him. They had people blindfolding him, spinning on him and beating him and say, prophesy who did it. Everything there was, and then he went willingly to the cross, the ultimate humiliation. He was humiliated. But therefore he shall lift up the head. That goes on to the exaltation of Christ, where here he is, he's risen from the dead, and he is exalted to the right hand of God the Father. Okay, there we are. Verse 2. Boy, we're getting all the way to verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not things on the earth. Reverend Clark says this, Love heavenly things and study them. Hmm. Love things that are in the Bible and study them. Uh, love ministry and study them. We will see something here as a great illustration of heavenly things when we get to verse 4. It says, and I, I want to point this out too. Earthly things are not necessarily bad. I enjoy a good roadster ride on a nice cool morning or a, a summer evening, something like that. Nothing wrong with that. But if that takes the place of your time with the Lord, if that comes before the Lord, that is an idol. Many earthly things are great. Nothing wrong with earthly things, but you set your mind on heavenly things, okay? Verse 3, for you died, you died to sin, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Verse 4, when Christ who is our life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. This is a heavenly thing, appearing with Christ in glory. So seek those things, study those things. Number one, be in the Word not just on Sunday morning or Thursday night or Tuesday night or whatever, be in the Word daily. And I don't mean that you have to spend three hours daily doing it. Man, there's some guys that do that and, and they're very knowledgeable and more power to them. I think it's great. But that isn't required. Actually, what's required? Knowing Jesus as your Savior. Why do we study His Word? So we can be more like Him. Verse 5. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Okay, put to death. The Greek is necrostate, necrosate or sauté. I don't know how to pronounce Greek very well, but it looks to me like necrosate, which means make dead. Doesn't mean merely control or suppress. It means make dead. Your members which are on the earth. And here it comes, kids. Fornication uncleanliness, passion, evil desire. All these things are referring to sexual sin. Fornication. What's fornication? Fancy word for sex outside of marriage. Yikes. You know, it's popular today to live with your intended spouse for a while just to see whether, along you, whether you get along or not. <sighs> I did that. And I've been married, this, I'm on my third marriage, because I made some bad decisions, one of which was living together prior to marriage. And I remember telling my 
<laughs> telling my folks, well, we're doing it so we can save money. And my dad just laughed. Yeah, right. That's not what it's for. That's sex outside of marriage, kids. Uncleanliness. What's uncleanliness? Well, again, sexual sin. What can that be? Well, bestiality, weird stuff, homosexuality. Sorry. That's what the Bible says. If you got an issue with it, take it up with the guy who wrote it. Not with me. That's what it says. Passion. It's not talking about being passionate about whatever you do. It's talking about evil passions, lustful passions, okay, where it takes over and that ends up becoming an idol. Sex, I think, is the biggest idol in the United States, probably actually worldwide today. I, I, it's my right to be able to have sex anytime I want, anywhere I want, and any way, any, with anybody I want to, just because that's my right. Because that's the way I feel. Baloney. That is uncleanliness and evil passion. And here comes the last one, evil desire. The thing that hit me when I, when I read this was Jethro Tull, Aqualung, sitting on a park bench, eyeing little girls with bad intent. That's the evil desire. You know the funny thing about that? I thought about that, and guess what ran through my mind all that night? That lousy song. <laughs> There's better songs to be running through your mind all night. But that's the deal. Evil desire. Knock, put it to death. It doesn't say suppress it or control it. It says knock it off. And covetousness which is idolatry. Covetousness is a sin against God because it becomes an idol. Covetousness is a sin against others because you are doing what you can to grab what somebody else has. And covetousness is self-destructive. Remember that. Now, it's funny that within recent years, I have heard even a young pastor's wife say, Oh, I covet your prayers. Boy, yeah, Mitch gave me the same reaction that I had, like, what are you thinking about? Coveting is bad. Do I desire your prayers? Do I, do I plead for your prayers? Yes. Coveting is idolatry. It's wrong. Bingo. Verse 6, because of these things, the wrath of God, the wrath of God, because of these things, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. That's those who are in habitual sin, those who do not give up habitual sin. <sighs> Does that mean that God is going to bring his wrath against you if you are a sinner? No. He loves us so much, us sinners so much, that He sent His Son to pay the price for our sins, what we should have paid, okay? But if we don't give up these sins, if we continue to have fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil as are these things, these are just the bit of it, covetousness, you know what? The wrath of God's coming on it. Again, sons of disobedience are those who are in habitual sin. Verse 7, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Yep, that's right. We all have had habitual sin in our lives. And uh, I have to go along with my hero Paul here where he says, Oh, what a wretched man I am, the chief of sinners I am. If you don't recognize that you're a sinner, you need to take a look inside a little bit better. Verse 8. Now, but now you yourselves are to put off these things. Put off all these things. It's like throwing away clothing that doesn't fit anymore. Put it off. You know, here it is. You know, there are times when that favorite shirt of yours that's 20 years old doesn't fit anymore. It ought to get thrown away. Okay, this is what they're trying to, this is the example. I'm not saying that's the deal, but it's like throwing away old clothes that don't fit. You put these things off, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, 
filthy language out of your mouth. Ruh -roh. If you're like me and you lose your temper, there are times that filthy language comes out of your mouth. It is not something that I like about myself. In recent years or months, probably more like it, I've taken to saying rats, which seems to work out really well. But then I fall into my old ways and say things I really shouldn't. And it doesn't just start when you're an old guy. It starts when you're a kid. I can remember calling my brother, who's eight years older than me, a dirty name. And uh, it's kind of funny. My granddad used to say, well, I'll be a dirty name. And I picked that up. And, uh, but that isn't what I said. I didn't say, you're a dirty name. I said something that I shouldn't have. And he says, I'm telling mom and dad, because he was babysitting us, I'm telling mom and dad, and boy, I'll tell you what, I cried and carried on. And he says, okay, if you just shut up, I won't, I won't tell them. How about that? I quit crying right away. I, little kids, little kids, you are born in sin, and in sin did your mother conceive you. These are those kind of things. Put off filthy language. It's best. You ever get around? You know, there's guys we know who don't even know they're saying it. It's just their adjective. It's just the way intensifier I had one guy say it. Now, nah, it's filthy language. It just shows that your vocabulary is not working so well. And again, I can fall into this too. Verse 9, do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man, that sinful man, and his deeds. Do not lie. Okay, here I have another illustration using myself. I was a young man at a family dinner where we used to play this card game called Screwy Louie, which was a modified gin. And it took, oh, somewhere about six decks of cards. That's kind of hard to shuffle when you got that many people. So what you do, you put the cards out there, throw them in the middle, and move them around and get your own cards. Well, if you happen to have a joker, which is, you know, a uh, wild, card. wild card, thank you, you put your finger on it and you move it around. Then your mom catches you doing it. And you know what she said to me? She said, you are a lie and a cheat. Ugh! Well, obviously it had an effect because I'm remembering it Lo, these 50 some odd years later, close to 60 years later, and uh, man, we do that. A lot of times people lie to try and keep others from getting their feelings hurt, okay? Sometimes we lie to keep ourselves out of trouble. I think a lot of times that's the case. It does not profit us to lie. My grandfather would say, if you don't lie, it's easier to remember what you said. Well, that's something to be said. Because you have put off, that's thrown like thrown away old clothes, the old man, that, that old sinner, with his deeds. Verse 10, and have put on, like those new clothes that fit, the new man, that person who is saved. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us that we are a new creation in Christ. Wow! Isn't that great? All the junk we've done, we are a new creation in Christ. We are a new man. We put on that new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of Him, capital H, who created Him. Where? There is neither Greek nor Jew circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all, is that word again, all in all. Okay, neither Greek nor Jew. Remember, the Jews didn't much care for Gentiles, thinking them to be unclean. Greeks didn't much care for Jews either. Seems like that's changed a lot in recent years, hasn't it? Yeah. Circumcised or uncircumcised. Barbarian. At the time, that was somebody who could not speak Greek if you were in the Roman Empire. 
So, that's why they called all those Krauts, all those Germans, Germanic tribes, barbarians, okay? And here's the one, the Scythians. Well, the Scythians were considered to be the most barbaric of the bunch. I mean, they were, well, I was trying to think. I used a really bad illustration the other night, but oh well. You know, it's kind of like the, the, the hillbillies that have no clue of cooth whatsoever. I guess that's what they're trying to refer to, and I'm not trying to run down somebody who grew up in the hills or anything. A lot of salt of the earth. But, you know, having no uh, manners whatsoever. It says, but. Oh, I like, no, wait a minute. Here's slave nor free. Now, there's a great note on that. Man, this is neat. In the arena of Carthage in AD 202, a profound impression was made on the spectators when the Roman matron Perpetua stood hand in hand with her slave Felicitas as both women faced a common death for a common faith. Neither slave nor free. They both stood up for their faith in the face of death. Great illustration on that. But Christ is all in all. Okay, verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. This is the exact opposite of what was going on in verse 8, where it says, Put these things off, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, and filthy language, but put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. Humility. You know, that really wasn't considered to be a virtue in ancient Greek. Ancient Greece, pardon me. That was not considered to be a virtue because it meant you were a sissy. You know, we want the stronger guys. We want Alexander the Great and all this stuff. All these... Meekness does not mean that you're a sissy. Meekness means that you take a back seat to others, and mostly you take a back seat to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Humility. You know, there are guys that you might know. I'm going to have to use my good friend and pastor, Pastor Ed Ray. He is a microbiologist, or at least that's what he set out to be. Pretty sharp guy, man of science. And yet, if you mention something about what a brainiac he is, he'll, ah, he is a sinner saved by Christ. That's a humble man. And I hope he doesn't watch this because it might embarrass him for being such a humble Man, verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving with one another. Ah, bearing with one another and forgiving. Forgiving me for being a jerk. I can be a jerk. I think most all of us can say that. There are times when we can all be jerks because for whatever reason, most of the time I think it's being selfish. Because here you are, you're trying to do all this stuff, and then everybody wants a piece of you. And how about me? Well, that's just being selfish. Okay? Bearing with one another. Forgiving one another. And here it is. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you also must do. Matthew 18. You guys may have heard this before, but it repairs that... Uh, Bears repairs. Bears repeating. Okay, that would be a repeating would be re, never mind. <sighs> Starting off in verse 15, it says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. If he still refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. 
If you fail to forgive your brother, who does that hurt? Yeah, it generally hurts yourself because you're carrying this junk along for a long time. You may have heard me use this illustration, but I can't think of a better one. My dad and I are driving down our street, Luther Street, and he, we're going along in a 68 LTD, and some guy off the side waves to my dad enthusiastically, and my dad goes like that, and he tells me, you know, I owe, still owe that guy a pop in the chop from second grade. Obviously, by the guy's enthusiastic waving, he didn't remember that whatsoever. My dad carried that with him for a number of years. Now, I'm not saying that my dad was this terrible guy, but that's something that we can all do. Knock it off. Don't carry it with you. Forgive these people. And if, if you can't bring them around, it's best just to not be around them, but you can still forgive them. That's best. Verse 14, but above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection. First Peter 4, 8 says, love does what? It covers a multitude of sins. My good friend Rod Bauman, the body man, said one time at a Bible study, he knew he had the answer right because he wrote down, Bondo covers a multitude of sins. And I hope he gets to watch this. That was a lot of fun. Love covers a multitude of sins. Verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you also were called in one body and be thankful. That peace of God, that what? Surpasses all understanding. That peace that comes over you that you didn't earn, you can't do anything for, it's the peace of God, surpasses all understanding, and be thankful for it. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Okay, that's Shekinah is the Hebrew word for dwell, which is a divine presence. Let that divine presence of God dwell in you richly and teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Those are various ways, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. Those are various ways that God delights in worship. Now, uh, I'll tell you what, there are times when in worship, uh, I can't get all the way through the song because it's moving so much that I get choked up. Of course, then again, that's not so tough. <laughs> I'm a crybaby. I'm not a I'm not a sissy, but I am a crybaby. <laughs> there was this. We had this one time in a church I was involved with a number of years ago that we would do what is called a ten embrace service, which is the words of Christ on Good Friday, well, the remaining words of Christ. And at the end of this service that would get con uh, darker and darker, progressively darker as the kept reading, put out another candle, put out another candle. If you've ever attended one, I think you get what I mean. Anyway, at the end, there is to be a strepitus, which is a loud noise. And this one time we had this peal of thunder. Ooh, that really, really was great. And the whole church was dark. And we had this one gal who had a wonderful voice who would sing a cappella. Were you there when, I, when they crucified my Lord? And man, that was so moving. And we were talking about this service, which we would do every year. And, and Karen said, well, at the end of the service, it's my duty to make Willie cry. And another gal says, well, that's not so tough. <laughs> Worship should be something that just you bury your heart. With, you know, just your heart is out there. Okay, does that mean that there's one specific way to worship? No. I like old hymns. I like new hymns. I like... Uh, really uh, minor key stuff. I like the blues, That so many, but there's so many different ways. And please don't get stuck saying, well, that's not the way we do these things. 
Step out. Creative worship is something that's spontaneous, and that too is something that delight the Lord delights in. Okay. Verse 17, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever. That means anything you do, whether at work, at worship, at play, at home, whatever. It says right there, whatever you do, in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Here comes the tough one. Here we are on verse 18, where it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Okay, we're going to go here to Ephesians 5. <laughs> and this is something that always comes up at weddings, at least the weddings that I perform. And I always like this because I'll start off by saying, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. As the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to her own, their own husbands in everything. And I always stop and say, and that's where the, where the husband always says, right there, right there, baby. Do you hear the man? That's what he says. Submit to me. And the wives are looking at him saying, no way, buckaroo, ain't going to happen. But what they fail to do is go on to the next portion where it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. What does that mean? Christ died for the church. Christ died for us. So guess what's happening here? Is that wives are asked to submit to their, the authority of their husbands, and husbands are asked to give up all their authority to wives or to die. Gee, what's tougher, giving up a little authority or dying? Well, it depends upon how much you like authority. But that's it. That's the whole thing. Really what this means is that a marriage is 100%, 100%, not a 50-50 deal. I always like to say, if you go into thinking it's 50-50, you're going to keep track. And all of a sudden, you're going to drop off to 45, and your wife's going to notice that, and she says, well, I'm not <laughs> uh, uh, this is a 50-50 deal. I'm going to only put in 40. And then you say, oh, she's only putting in 40. I'm dropping off to, before you know it, nobody's putting in anything. No, 100%, 100%. That means doing the most you can at all time. May not be easy, but that's the way God intended it. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Verse 20, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Well, that's awfully tough when you're strong-willed. <laughs> uh, it's awfully tough when you have parents that don't love the Lord, or a parent that doesn't love the Lord. It's awfully tough. But I'll tell you one that was tougher. There was, a, so there was a guy who submitted to his father after spending a long time in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, Father, if there's any way this cup can pass, but not my will, your will be done. Jesus Christ submitted to the Father and paid the price for our sins, went to the cross, willingly. I don't think it's too tough for kids to obey their parents. 21. And this helps kids want to obey your parents. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. You know, there's so many dads that I've seen that put down their kids. Rats. I just don't understand it. Maybe what they're trying to do is build themselves up. You know, my dad used to say, you cannot build yourself up by putting other people down. But there are fathers who will do that to their own children. I was blessed to not have a dad who did that. Now, of course, he'd go by and look, in my, and look at Mike and me and say, what are you boys doing? <laughs> it was more to correct us. He didn't say, boy, you guys are a bunch of idiots. He'd just say, what are you doing? Oh, what, what are you doing, you know? <laughs> Realizing that we're kids. 
Don't discourage. Fathers, don't discourage your kids. 22, bond servants, which now speaks today of an employee-employer relationship. Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. That's reverencing God. Okay, not with eye service. I keep going back that we had a young man at work down here a number of years ago now who was absolutely the best that I have ever said, seen at pretending to be busy. He didn't get a darn thing done, but every time you looked at him, man, he was just busy. It was interesting enough that the guy, my friend Saul at the back shop, Sal, pardon me, not Sal at the back shop said, boy, yeah, I noticed that too. <laughs> Don't do it. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, reverencing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. If it's tough to do something for whomever you're working for, remember you're doing it to the Lord, and that makes it a bit on the easier side. Ugh. Verse 24, knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. And there is no, no partiality. Here it is. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. When a Christian worker does poorly in his job, he should not expect special leniency from his boss, especially if his boss is a Christian. Being a Christian should do what? Make us more responsible not less responsible. Again, so the world out there can know that we are Christians by our love. Our hero Paul here is just letting us know that it's not carnality that gets us to heaven by all the different stuff that he said, don't do it anymore. It's not the character of the new man that gets us to heaven, although that's our response. He talks to us about the Christian home, wives, husbands, children. And he goes on to talk about how we ought to be when we are working for somebody else. I hope that you guys have had as much fun with this as I have. It's, it's been really a pleasure to see what all Paul has to say for us. And we have one more episode with Paul and his uh, uh, letters to the Colossians next week and then we'll be on to Thessalonians. We're going to stay in the letters of Paul for a while because man it's again not only is it corrective but it's also encouraging. So with that I'd, I'd like to encourage you by saying the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.